Chelsea, nice Chelsea, to see you. Chelsea, nice to say hello. I have to say, you look very spiffy. That is kind of you to say. I have to work hard at this because, uh, um, you know, it's all a facade. I, there was a cowboy hat attached to this. I, I'm supporting the local uh, Canardia Dry. Do you want to hear something really disappointing? Yes. Canada Dry isn't even made in Canada. Does that make you really sad <laughs> hearing that? No. <laughs> I love ginger ale. I'm in my mind and heart that it's entirely a Canadian product. So, uh, yes, you can tell me that, but I won't. I don't believe you. Oh, okay. But I, I, I guess I have to because <laughs> you're the. I'm from the South, so we. Um, at Texas, specifically, where I'm Louisiana, but I spend a lot of ta time in Texas. Really? And for some reason, us, when, when, when I'm Texan, we put an R in here. Do you all ever hear us say that, that you all are Canardians? No. We, yeah, in yeah, I've never heard that before. In Texas, if I had a cowboy hat, I would say I'm going to Canardia, or <laughs> them Canardians have come down for barbecue. So what do you think of us Canardians? <laughs> Clearly, I'm thinking you're pretty good at making ginger ale. <laughs> but that would, be, that would be a false uh, false consideration. I love Canada. I've always had a great time here. I think that uh, the people, of course, are so inviting and, and um, kind and, and fun. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think there's so much to do here. You, you, you have a lot of land up here. We do. There's a lot to do uh, in that land, you know, and then there's a lot of nothing too. So I think it's, it takes a lot to occupy your, your entertainment of life when, you know, you've got to fill a lot of space. You don't have that huge a population that you're on top of each other. So mm -hmm. I give you a lot of credit for keeping it, keeping it real out in the tundra. <laughs> and also that yeah I know right also I'm I, I feel akin because my heritage is uh, is Acadian really no from, yeah so New Brunswick which is like y'all would call that the country I'm sure I mean that's way up there right and how far is that from is that like six seven hours oh yeah and you gotta maybe 12 hours yeah yeah right and so that 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 group of people were uh, asked to leave or decided not to bow down to the king is that what it was and then like okay well get out well they kept getting that get out all the way through north america all the way through the united states until they landed in louisiana mm -hmm. and down there they landed um with a bunch of other people who weren't thought of so well slaves and they mixed and became cajun so that's my heritage. And so, yeah, I think I have a special place in my heart for, uh, you know, Canada in general, but particularly New Brunswick, Quebec, Quebec. So you're planning a trip. It's like 20 minutes down the road if you're planning a family reunion after this. I'm feeling like they're already here. I've met, a <laughs> I've met half of them. Anyone here from Quebec? Nope. See? Thank you. Yeah, one hand over thank there. You. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank, nice to have you. I will write you a check. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been great, and I always enjoy coming. And I don't get this way as often. Occasionally we work in, on the, the West Coast in Vancouver, but there's a lot of work here. It's just yeah. I don't end up working here. I end up working more in Vancouver than I do this side, um, Montreal, or Toronto, mm -hmm. but I love those cities. I think those are great cities. Um, I, I call them provincial because I find them to be the best foot forward. Mm -hmm. Like you go to Montreal or Toronto, it's the prettiest, most pristine, no litter. You're really making a good impression, sort of like Washington DC in our and then you're Washington D.C. is Ottawa, right? Yeah. Which is beautiful, you know, old heritage, old old historic buildings, and and cold as the coldest place I've ever been. I mean, I'm not sure about that, but it it's so cold that I still remember it in 2014, <laughs> and uh, I was there 
and the, it was cold. But thankfully, they had adult beverages. <laughs> it is the key. That was able to warm me up a little bit. And that was kind. We had um, a show there. It was the Ottawa Hop Expo, I think. It was great. The, the river was froze. Is that the St. Lawrence? Anyone here from Ottawa? Ottawa River. Is right it? over here, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rideau Canal, maybe? Was it in, and people were. Oh, ice, yeah, that would be the Rideau Canal. People were yeah. ice skating to work. <laughs> and I was like, that seems so fun. Mm -hmm. It's a cowboy hat walking out. Um, she's heard me talk well too, far too many times. It looks good on you, though. Don't you think it looks great on yeah. Scout? Is that the everybody? Is that. That's hot. You know where she should be? Calgary, right? Yeah. Or Stampede, which is one another town that I like very much in Canada. Um, Beaver Tails? Yeah. In uh, Ottawa, but maybe only Ottawa? Is that their thing? Yeah, it's their thing. It's at a couple different places. Were you really confused when someone said, yeah. let's go get a beaver tail? So much so. I was like looking for my knife. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Any port in a storm, right? Yeah. You know, so, uh, but yeah, I thought Ottawa was uh, interesting. So cold, my God. But I, you, you deal with that every winter, so no big deal. Someone said that it might snow today. It might flurry, it might like sprinkle. Flurry. Yeah. That's not really snowing, is it? The yeah. flurry. No. Okay. Well, well uh, right if that's not, yeah. uh, I love, uh, I love that Canada is supportive of its thing, whatever that is. It's many things, but you know, starting with, with hockey, my God, you know, I love it's, it's hard to get community to be passionate anymore. There's so many distractions, but as a country, you all band together to support things that you care for, even, you know, the baseball, Blue Jays, it's not your heritage sport, but you've always supported baseball, even with the Expos. Mm -hmm. Always had great baseball support to the point where you go and see the, when the Blue Jays are playing in Seattle, you outdraw Mariners to go support that. I'm assuming that, what are some other things you support? Uh, well, we have football, so the CFL, but there's some NFL lovers here too. What but about music? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Right, the music that's fantastic. Deep. You got any flowers that you like, like a poppies? Of, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> do you support the growing of the forests, or any, I mean, do you, tulips. tulips? Thank yeah. you. That's tulips I thought there was something a little bit. Yeah. yeah, tulips, right? Yeah, it's really beautiful. Just tons of tulips. It's every year. And, See, yeah, it's quite nice. And I I find Canadian culture to be um, community. You know, I think just basically how. It, you operate your government your taxation system i think it all s serves as a community and um not to get political but you know when that type of thing starts to unravel the rules that were in place or set for the best interests don't necessarily apply as much anymore and i think you get into trouble there and i feel like the country i live in is in a lot of civil unrest mm -hmm. in that way i don't know if y'all are it doesn't ever seem like it. We always have this. That's why we all want to move up here when a certain person gets elected. <laughs> now, uh, speaking of baseball, you're quite the baseball junkie. I am. Yeah. I'm entirely. I'm going to take a drink of this Canadian be <laughs> this beverage. Now, what is your baseball team? That's Canada. Um, <laughs> my baseball team is the Atlanta Braves mm -hmm. um, because they were on TV. So, uh, in the South where I grew up. It, anyone anyone follow the Expos? Anyone old enough to have? Remember when they were the only team in town before yeah. the Blue Jays? Of course, that's why you followed them. Even, even though you lived in Vancouver, you're still like Montreal. So that would be the reason for the Braves. And then after that, when I was doing The Walking Dead, it is in Atlanta where we shoot. And so I would go to the games afterward after i got to off work and it was just so great they weren't very good then but it was really still fun they're they're better now and of course in baseball they've had a long run of being quite good but um when i played i was with the seattle mariners and uh the houston astros and we were mediocre which you know isn't very good mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Well, at least you're honest with that. Some people are like, we are the best, no matter what. I think you should always say you're the best at at everything and and then um, fake it till you make it. That's Hollywood Mm -hmm. shuffle. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, speaking of The Walking Dead, how was that for you? Like, did you see, you know, after zombies were done, they're seen like taking a cigarette after it. It was kind of really weird for you to to see. It's, It's exactly what you see. So you start by being rather repulsed. I don't. I don't know how to explain it, but you see people and the makeup is so good mm-hmm. and it's just disgusting. And you look at body parts and skin and flesh coming off and you know they, 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 they put maggots in them and they've got raw meat hanging it's off crazy. of them and it's really dug in and intense and you're, you're repulsed. You would have no interest. And so my first couple weeks, I just stayed away. I, I would see them and not connect that they were people actors Mm -hmm. and then you get stuck in a scene with them not stuck but you're you're engaged in a scene you might be eight hours with them for the day and at some point you start talking to them because you're so bored and you end up talking about current events and politics and books and music and sports and whatever and, and you're have lunch with them and it's disgusting they're trying to eat through their and then they leave and you leave to end the night and it's some hot chick like you that's leaving saying i'll see you tomorrow lou and i'm like who are you i'm (laughs) the person that you've been talking to all day yeah i'm like what so it's it really is this bizarre uh thing but you do get desensitized to it after a while and, and pretty soon it doesn't bother you and you understand exactly who they are. Yeah. I always was very sensitive to what they were going through because it's a lot of work going through that makeup. It's a lot of work going through the build and the process and there's a lot of expectation to put on them. And if it doesn't work, they get kind of dismissed sent to the back you know it's like look dude you're not moving right you know and how are you supposed to, who here knows how to move like a walker right you know it's not like you grew up playing walkers and indians is it <laughs> um, so i i had a lot of i had a lot of uh respect for just the the patience that they would have sitting in that chair because it's about four hours in the morning they show up about 4 a.m and get that that all the prosthetics put on and the makeup and then they're out there and i've seen times literally when i say prosthetics this is a, a plastic compound rubber that they glue on them i've seen it so hot in georgia that it's melted on these people where it's just running plastic down them and it's just disgusting mm-hmm. and it's hard it's it's, it's harsh mm-hmm. harsh conditions um Dehydration, exposure to sun, snakes, uh, long hours, fatigue, uh, poison ivy, poisonous plants, bugs. I mean, just everything that could just take you out is is part of that experience entirely. So now you mentioned doing a scene that sometimes it would take eight hours. Like, let's say you know a whole episode ballpark. How many hours are you putting into that? Well, you always put in a solid twelve to fourteen a day, but you only get eight days to do the episode. Oh wow! So there's a ten day block. So you do you work you 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 work five, and you take two days off Saturday Sunday. Then you come back and work three, to catch up you know to finish your week so let's say you finish the episode on wednesday then on thursday you start the next episode Mm -hmm. the following and it's and you got a new director fresh blood he's enthusiastic and you're exhausted but uh, what would happen is you would collectively take this sigh of accomplishment and relief that we did great and you somewhere on sunday we saw the episode air and it was great and the audience reaction was great and you realized ah, we have to own up to that mm-hmm. we have to do that even better this time or we might get canceled we would spend a lot of time thinking we were going to get canceled well speaking of that audience reaction you know obviously walking dead had such a huge following you know first season blew up second yeah. season was huge coming into it in the third season was there any pressure when you were told you were going to be on the third season of the show less pressure 
than what there is today. Certainly less pressure than if you uh, came on board, let's say season four, five, six, which I think there was a lot of pressure as ratings were going. It's hard to maintain something, so I think. We were still building in season three. We'd just come out of season two, which was a long time in Herschel's farm. I think the audience and the show was kind of over being set in this one location where the, not much was going on. There wasn't much movement. There certainly wasn't much fresh blood. So when we showed up as the prisoners, it was like, yay, new faces, new people. All right, I've been waiting for these guys. That's great. We got a new environment, perfect. Because we had gone a whole season without new people. We had had some dead walkers walking around, but no, not many new people. And so when the prisoners showed up, everybody was very excited. You know, the prison, a new place to call home and develop. And then Woodbury shows up with President Trump. And uh, I mean, the governor. Uh, <laughs> who I actually adored. I love that character. Anybody like the governor? Who thinks the governor... Who's who's for the governor, and who's for Negan? Who do you take? You, you like Negan? You like those bad boys? I, yeah. I, I can see that. I see that in you. you know, that's, yeah, that, I get it. But I love the governor. There's a great book, called, uh, compendium, a graphic novel called Rise of the Governor, which is probably some of you have read it, and it's it's the blueprint of what David Morrissey, the actor, used to build his character. I thought. The dilemma of having a child not be the child that it, it was, but still having the love. Anybody here who's a parent knows how special a child is, and you can never let go, ever. And so I think we experience that in, in the form of uh, traumatic injuries in birth defect, in all manner of things that are real. You know, I think The Walking Dead is a metaphor for life in all aspects, and we always talked about that. Walkers are, are just metaphors for debt, for health, for political strife, for education. It's just obstacles in your life that you have to get up and survive every day. Not one of us can overcome our what well, used to be our cell phone bill today. I don't know what it is. It's our, for me, it's, it's a, uh, our utilities, lighting, heat, and water, and that crap. But so that's what we always felt like what we were dealing with. And I think that's why the characters seem so real, because they're dealing with real things, real survival, not just staying alive, but paying your bills. Who, who doesn't experience that? There's, very, there's only 1%, right, in the world that doesn't experience that. The rest of us have got to get up and get on the wheel. And that's how it was with The Walking Dead. So we would talk about those things quite a lot. And the, the idea of children, interestingly, uh, Carl specifically, uh, and or Judith, about how we were generally a show of adults who had had a experience of life before this apocalyptic transition. So a guy like Carl, he was grow raised in that environment. What were his dreams? He wasn't really having dreams of proms and and Little League baseball games and first kisses and those things that we had all had. We were all hearkening back to bygone times, the good old days of, of this, going to conventions. But Carl was having to experience life and understanding of life in this hor horrible setting that we were very sensitive to. And someone like Judith, born in those, that setting, what kind of memories were they building so we were very conscious of those kinds of things i think you're uh, without giving away spoilers anyone that's caught up is starting to see younger faces on the show we're sort of growing an audience don't feel offended from you who've been there since day one just bringing new people into the fold right and i think that's important and and young people want to see themselves on tv right it's fun to see judith you know, so, and I get that. And if we're not paying attention, look how popular Stranger Things is. So pay, att <laughs> pay attention, right? Yeah. Sorry, was that an answer to your question? I don't know. Uh, yeah. 
Well, I'm curious to know too, you know, how deep, because obviously you put a lot of thought into the role for Walking Dead. Yeah. What did you kind of do in preparation to get on the show? Well, it was interesting. The, because of my horror background, uh, like Scout with the Rob Zombie work, um, the Walking Dead was brought to my attention and my desk in the form of the graphic novel. I'm sure a lot of you had read it. I thought it was really special and cool. I'm not a graphic novel guy necessarily, but based on the material, I was like, yeah, it's great. Someone mentioned they thinkered about doing a TV show. I go, well, not, not with this. This is way too violent. This will never see the light of day on television. <laughs> so when I was brought in originally for the pilot, I read for the role of Merle. Mm -hmm. And thankfully they hired Michael Rooker, right? I mean, he was great. Um, and then a, a, a couple months later, they brought me in. They said, look, we know you were in for Merle, but we're going to ask you to read for Merle has this brother. We don't, he doesn't have a name yet and he doesn't actually have any lines yet. So could you just read Merle again, but do it different as if he had a brother. So thankfully they hired Norman Reedus to be Daryl, right? Mm -hmm. You're glad about that, right? I love Norman Reedus. I know, <laughs> yeah. I noticed, I know that about you. Um, so. Then when Axel came along, they brought it to my, and they said, we think you're right. And at the time I was doing a movie called The Lone Ranger for, uh, for Disney with Johnny Depp. And it was so much fun. And I was riding a horse and I had a big mustache and, and I wasn't done with this movie. And they said, well, you have some time off. Can you start our show? And then I, and I said, you're going to make me shave my mustache. I can tell this is what always happens. So I can't really do your show. And I, I actually, Decline the offer. Thanks. I'll get it. I'll get you on the next one. And they're like, no, we love the mustache. Just use it. And so I was like, okay, really? You know, it's kind of like dating. You're like, really? Okay. <laughs> and so they did. It was cool. And it turns out my mustache for Axel was like iconic, right? They'll never be remembered in Lone Ranger, but uh, the Axel mustache is precedes me by a long way. Uh, yes. What's it like to work with Rob Zombie? Yeah. Know. Rob's great. Rob is entirely intense um, in his person, but as a guy, he's just real. He's really fun. He's got a great sense of humor, but it's all about work. Uh, most of these things are about work. People say, oh, you're on The Walking Dead. What's that like? It's like a really hard day at work. It's not like a hard day at work or laying cement. I will yeah. admit that, but you, you have to deliver. And for Rob, you really do. It's, it's, uh, he, he knows what he wants and he wants what he knows. It's that simple. And if it doesn't work, then he's going to move on. And typically it's going to be without you. So you want to be able to, and he expects you to bring something. So if you're invited to the party, bring some bean dip, you know, don't show up <laughs> empty handed, right? Yeah. Bring your game, bring, and that's why he's hired you as an expectation. So you should be, uh, bringing that. He, at times I would ask him things and he'd say, you know what, I, you're the actor. You are the actor. You figure it out. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I wrote it, but I don't. I didn't write it to know. I'm, I'm counting on you figuring that out and bringing it. So he's he's got a really good take on storytelling. So he understands. You know, once upon a time, there's a beautiful girl, and she lived in a place, and and then they lived happily ever after. I mean, it, it really gets down to telling a story. When you start, you think it's all about you. But as you get to work more, you understand I'm a spoke in the wheel and I'm here to serve the story, mm -hmm. whatever the story is. And it, it works better that way. It, it, the once upon a time, the campfire works when you're telling the story. So that's the advice I would offer. Tell your story in life, whatever that is, it, through whatever your means you're doing that. Don't no man or woman can walk out on their own story. You'll tell a lot of other people's stories. You'll tell Power 101 story for a long time. 101.9? Fresh, 104.5 Fresh Radio. Yeah. Wait, oh, sorry. I'm the older guy. So you're, okay. the, the, you're less fresh. <laughs> you're, you're, you're right, they're fresh. Yeah, exactly. You're gonna tell their story, but at some point you're gonna, you're going to have to own up to your story. And that's about the time where I'm gonna go do something, I'm gonna go start my own, I'm gonna go do something, or I'm gonna go manage 
101 or I'm going to, so t- you, you will tell your story. Don't be afraid of it. It's always better to start. I wish someone had told me at your age to go tell my story. I would have, I would have been better off. And so I think in, especially in today's environment, don't work for anybody, work for yourself. Right. Um, the walking dead is so good because of the preparation that you're talking about, but also because it's such a family unlike any that I had ever experienced and that we would talk as a unit, not just the actors, but the producers, the writers, the directors, hair, makeup, wardrobe, camera department. We were all pulling on the same side of the rope. So there was no hierarchy. There was no uh, divas. It was all, and we had a quarterback. It was Andrew Lincoln. All right. It was, he was our Tom Brady. He carried the ball and he made it work. Brian. What was it like working with Andrew Lincoln and uh, Norman Reedus on the set? Well, Andrew is amazing. So at that time, as I mentioned, there was, it was all roads led to Sheriff Rick Grimes. All the storylines, even the governors were built to go through him. As the show started to grow, there were other storylines, right? And it started to not be so much about what's the sheriff gonna do about this. And so when I was on the show, the writers were really focused on that. And so Andy had a lot of work to do and and we all helped him tell his story that was the story to tell there was no ideas of Negan or you know Glenn and Maggie are going to get married or any that, that, that stuff didn't play it was all roads lead to so I felt like he had an incredible burden to, but he was a perfect quarterback and delivered every time um, now that being said he worked his tail off delivering you know he would start the week by going to Los Angeles learning how to speak English when I say English, I mean Southern redneck English, not old English like the country he's from. Then he would fly back and start the scenes and he would be in the right type of Southern dialect that he needed. He did that every week um, just to be on top of his game. But he would try a lot of things. and, and, And what's great is he sucked on a lot of it, but it was through the effort of trying. Now, as the show grows, I, I spoke with him last year before, uh, I feel like there's some spoilers, not everyone's caught up, so whatever. Um, and he said, yeah, I don't get to work as much anymore because Negan has to work. And, you know, the whispers have to work and there's these other stories. So we like it as an audience, as an actor, you don't get as much attention as you may have used to, but he's great. Uh, Daryl, Norman Reedus, I've been known a long time before I got to the show. In fact, he was one of the only guys that I knew when I showed up on the show. When you show up on the show, you're invited in like a long lost family member and you're so loved and where have you been? It's so great. Help us build. It's so good to have you. You're going to be, and it's, you really feel like you, you, you're meant to be there, which is great. Norman was the only guy I knew and, and Scott Wilson and you show up and no one's names are on their trailer because it's all secret. They have these code names. <laughs> And no one's name's on the call sheet. The call sheet is the, uh, the reference of what the day's going to be, the scene work that you're going to do. No one's real names. There are all these, these, yeah. And I was like, oh, man, I got duped. I'm doing some webisode. I don't know who any of these people are. Ridiculous. And then Norman came out, and we've been knowing each other, so it was great. Um, I think the pressure's really on him because he's going to have to quarterback a little bit. Right. And he's been used to being the smoldering, brooding guy and, you know, having to deal with his little thing, but help the sheriff. And now he's the guy, right? He gets to step up. Can he, can he do it? I think he can do it. Well done. Chelsea's yeah. on, on team Norman. I have a question. What was your code name? Uh, my code name was Stegosaurus. Really? Stegosaurus. Wow. The shy Stegosaurus. That's awesome. It was pretty awesome, which I'm anything but. Um, uh, yeah, so all of those things play. It was also, you asked a good question about in season three, we're still under the radar a little bit. The show works because we're not in Hollywood. We don't have a lot of executives or TMZ or Entertainment Tonight or People Magazine in, in, in our, our grill all the time. We're down there to work and we're, we're able to work. Um, but season three, we were under the radar just enough where we weren't massively popular we were massively popular but not like how it is today i mean there was a time like when we were in ottawa in 2014 i can remember norm and i going to dinner with jason momoa 
no problem. Today, you can't do that. We got to go eat in the kitchen. I can go to dinner, but Norman, probably Jason too, you know, it's just the audience likes to atta attach themselves. The other thing is on The Walking Dead, we always referred to the audience. We never really referred to the fans. We always felt like the audience was as much a part of the show as we were a part of them. So there was sort of this symbiotic relationship. So we recognized that and somehow it gave us, I think, an, a respect. Let's, we're doing this for the audience and they're doing this for us. They're gonna let us know if we're good or we suck and we'll do the same by the ratings. And so I think there's always been a really healthy respect, which is important. It's important that you are participating. You are watching the show, you're commenting on it, you're supporting it uh, because it gets back and then it's, it's returned. So that is important. Questions? Yeah, do we have any questions? Is it, it's Bryson. Yeah, right, right on. Oh, I was going to say, first of all, he'd have a problem with Negan, no doubt. Uh, I think Axel, in general, is a uh, peacemaker. So it's always about, whoa, guys, let's, let's try to, we, let's avoid this. Mm -hmm. But I think when push comes to shove, Axel recognizes the affirmative. So I don't know, I don't think he would ever want to be in a situation where he or people he cares about are helpless. I'm not sure Axel would ever drop to his knees in, although I did, <laughs> with, <laughs> with the gun point in my head with Rick. So, But my point is, I, I, what we should learn, we should take real lessons. If someone came in this room, the reality of us all, um, the military would tell us, the police officers, any police officers here? Any military guys? Okay, you would tell us, look, um, Giving yourself up or it, it makes you a, bit, a fish in a barrel. And at some point, we're going to have to rush the guy with the bat. We're, we're fight or flight. It's, it's, it's that simple. It's always been since the days of cavemen. Since I'm either going to run from a saber tooth tiger or we're going toe to toe. I might not win, but I'm going down because it's not about me winning. It's about me saving you, right? So I think Axel would have that instinct, essentially. Going to the whispers, I think... It's confusing enough for Axel what this world has transitioned to because he didn't see it turn the way everyone else did. Remember, we were locked up in that prison. So we came out. It was bewildering to see these things. It was yeah. bewildering to what had happened to the world. You know, I mean, it was bad enough being locked in with, you know, four other guys that were kind of not sure. But to come out and see this world that had changed so drastically, it's hard for old people. It's hard to change, but you must. So I think he was would have a difficult time and get his head around the walkers and then people dressing like walkers to 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 do harm. I think he would have a real problem understanding what the point of that was. The great thing about Axel, like Herschel, God rest his soul in real life, Scott Wilson, we love that man, is Axel has hope. I mean, without hope, what do you have? Mm -hmm. Really? I mean, without hope, you don't have today. You don't have tomorrow, that's for sure. So hope and faith, and I think Axel would always have that. It's gonna get better. There's, there's a better day. This is happening for a reason. It's gonna be okay. The sun's gonna rise, it's gonna be good. And I feel like Axel would be really serviceable to the group in that way, the way Herschel was. The way, you know, sometimes we need, we need a good old voice of reason. Yeah. You know, we need our Abraham Lincoln. Who's Canada's Abraham? Who's the, who's the voice of? We have a Johnny McDonald. Okay. Are we going with John A? I'm fine with that. <laughs> go with John. Let's do, go, let's go with John. <laughs> Any other questions in the room? I'm going to, got, you got one, Brian. Yeah. Remind me. Oh, Kendra. Kendra. Dang it. Okay. Scary. We had never been in that. It was all built. It wasn't a real prison. It was a sound stage. It was a set. They oh, wow. built it and they didn't let us know what was around every corner. And it was dark and they wouldn't let us go in. So every time that we got 
a step further and deeper into it. We didn't know. And they made us, so it was real reactions. We didn't know walkers were coming out of anywhere. And it was creepy. And there was real dark and dirty. And man, I, it was it was impressive what they did. And um, you felt like there were times where you were, you were they would leave you in a place and you'd just be there all day by yourself. We're gonna get to you, but basically you're gonna be here. Why don't you just get used to the environment? We'll be back. And they wouldn't come back the whole day and you'd be just, you know, it, it was scary. I, I, I was uh, not, I liked being with other people, as you can tell. Brian, sorry, you had a question. Good question, Kendra. What was the atmosphere on the endless like? <laughs> that was great. It, it, there's a movie that I did, uh, Brian has seen, it's called The Endless, it's on Netflix. If you want to kind of question your existence, like right now, like who's, ru <laughs> who's running, who's in charge of your life, if you, this is a good movie to watch. It's about a cult uh, in San Diego, the Haley Bob cult, the Heaven's Gate cult, if you uh -huh. remember. It, yeah, and, um, and time loops, and they never leave. They just keep coming back better and better and better. And, uh, you know, these are two young filmmakers that are like the Duffer brothers that do the uh, Stranger Things franchise. Mm -hmm. And they're really smart. Um, they were great. They are young and cool. And we were all at a camp in San Diego, a Bible camp that was vacant. So it was very communal. It was like camping. Um, it's a bunch of cool young millennials and this old guy, me, and it's a lot of beer drinking. It was fun. Uh, but I felt like what was great was that they were young filmmakers learning and I was an old filmmaker learning too. And I recognize that. And that's what I mean about, uh, you have to, you must change. You must adjust. The only thing that's constant, really, I don't even think taxes are, and I'm questioning death to be honest with you. I'm not sure that that's real. Um, but I do think the North Star is always there. So every night I could look at the North Star and say, okay, I'm working with a bunch of young kids. I'm not sure what they're doing, but I'm going with it. It's fun. And the movie's really good. And it's done really well. It's like 98% Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, wow. And it's it's so good. And, and they're the filmmakers of the future. But they learned a lot from me too. You know, they come in, they come out of editor suites. They would say, action and cut, just right. And I'd say, don't say cut so soon. You don't know what's going to happen. I might, I might do something really cool or she's going to do something really cool that might be serviceable. And they're like, really? Okay. So they would learn too, but it was, it was a good environment. It was, it was a lot of rehearsal and healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Very underrated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. This weird movie I saw with you. Oh, that's that's precious. <laughs> <laughs> the neighbor. Oh yeah. The neighbor. What does that movie Was it home? Yes. Home, yeah, where the girl gets taken in by the house. And you were yeah. persistent. And <laughs> Letting her know, like, look, this place, it's haunted. Look, yes, that yeah. guy's looking at us. Yeah, it was fun. I was uh, looking for you, and that was good makeup and costume. With that. For do. those of you who don't know me, I am a blonde, um, kind of a ginger. I'm doing a pirate movie right now um, that's it's kind of Goonies meets... Uh, Back to the Future, and I'm doing this sort of Jeffrey Rush character, and he's kind of a steampunk uh, professor with the time machine, right? And uh, I'm inclined to think that you're going to like it. It's a kid's movie um, that's 12 year olds. How old are you, Kendra? Nine. Nine, you're gonna like this movie. And it's about five kids. And so I just decided I would go, I'm trying to go for the Snape thing, you know, kind of <laughs> nefarious, dark professor. Is he good or is he bad? So um, uh, I like to mix it up. I think that's the opportunity that you get, whether you choose it or not is up to you, but you get a chance to be different every day. I do believe we have a question. Down sorry, down. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, um, I, uh, well, I read that you're uh, going to be in the once upon, a upon, sorry, once upon a Time in Hollywood. There's this young director named Quentin Tarantino. I think he's going to have some pretty good, uh, oh, uh. I think he's got some legs. I think he might have a future, this guy. You know, that experience is amazing. Just to be observing 
I'm a spoke in a wheel in that movie, which is fine. But to watch DiCaprio and Brad Pitt and Al Pacino and Jack Nicholson and Kurt Russell and Margot Robbie, and, uh, Luke Perry before he had passed, God rest his soul. Um, and then to have Quentin Tarantino overseeing it all. And this guy is, is a madman. He becomes his movie. And he's so excitable and he's so energetic and he's exactly the way you think he is. And he's so passionate about the work. And it's so, it's such an exciting day and it's huge. I mean, it's, it's Hitchcocky and it's, it's the old school, you know, and the big camera rigs and big film canisters and, and jib arms and lights. And it's a great, experience in the story and Quentin runs it all I don't you know this this is his movie and you know he he is in charge not DiCaprio not Brad Pitt and they they fall in and they do great it's gonna be such a good movie and it was such a good experience to be part of it and that Quentin Tarantino picked me and said, yeah, I, I wonder, you know, can you come do this thing? I got this thing. I don't know exactly how it's going to go, but I got this thing and I need you to do that. But I, I can't do this thing unless I get your commitment for you to come and do that. And I still don't know what this thing is, but I was happy to be there to look for it. And the movie's going to be great. If you haven't seen the trailer, check it out. It's so great. It's um, Hollywood 1969. It's, it's circles around the Manson murders. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool. And, uh, I think, not that that's cool, but just that time, there's no one here that can really connect with that. But man, we went to the moon. We went to the moon, we had, we had hippies and facial hair and civil rights and all manner of things were going on. Yeah, that, that was a tough one, a really a tough one. Yes. Well, you were gonna ask about it. Was there a specific thing? I can tell you all of my experience that it was great and I can't tell you a lot about the script is, you know, it's kind of out there. It's not the script, but the storyline is a, an actor who's not fallen from grace, but he's having a difficult time as we do. Is there a theme going on here? Because I keep saying, you know, you have to adjust, you have to, uh, we have this thing in, in Los Angeles called the La Brea Tar Pits. And what that is, is it's where they find dinosaurs maybe stegosaurus <laughs> and i'm trying not to be one of those dinosaurs but that's just where old actors go they're not dinosaurs at all they're just actors that haven't adjusted and you must because time waits for no man nor woman so you have to keep moving who'd have thought we'd have cellular devices we don't even call them cell phones anymore do we what do we call them iphones androids yeah not even cell phones there's no cell about it, right? No. I mean, it's, so yeah, um, it's about an actor that's having a hard time making the adjustments to what those were because in 60, you know, the early 60s, we were still out of that atomic age from the, the 50s, right? And idealistic. And then the 60s, we have a lot of movements and this guy's not dealing with it very well. And, um, you know, he decides to try to get in the swing of things and connect with some hippies and they happen to be the Manson family. And his next door neighbor happens to be Sharon Tate. Wow. So very interesting, yeah. And Capro's fantastic, and so is Brad Pitt. They're handsome guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but Margot Robbie's great too, as Sharon yeah. Tate. I mean, everyone's great in the movie. I'm not so good, but everyone else is really good. <laughs> Do we got any other questions? What was it like working with, uh, I mean, work with Sidney? Yeah. yeah. Well, that was interesting because I had never, before The Devil's Rejects, had never actually done a horror film. And I was really nervous about it. Um, and then when I got cast, I called my friend Walton Goggins, who had done House of a Thousand Corpses. And he's also a Southern guy, and he's, done, he's got such a lovely career. And I said, man, I'm bothered with this Rob Zombie devil-worshipping guy. I didn't even know much about him, but um, I'm a good boy from the South, a Christian raised man why would i go and he said oh dude do yourself a favor and go do this and you'll have a friend forever and it'll be a great experience and it was but at the table read with these guys bill mosley ken foray sid haig and william forsyth there was just something about this was 
was going to be better than most. And we all sort of brought our A game and then they raised that and it just was a perfect storm. I, they taught me about the invasion of personal space and that's what makes a good horror film. When you're being bothered, it's because your personal comfort level is being uh, invaded. And little things, just like when you talk and just getting a little closer than you should to somebody. That's, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, predatory, it's fearful, you know? And so you, you sense that in this movie and they were so good. And they were our Tom Brady's. Uh, they were our, our quarterbacks. They, they made it as good as it was and we followed. Thankfully we had um, a group of actors who could observe that and follow you know, and, and understand. Marching orders, man. Yeah. We got a question from the Ghostbuster in the back. <laughs> Joseph! Can I just introduce everyone to Joseph? Uh, I've met most of y'all today, thank you. Uh, he impresses me so much just in his person that he's not afraid to bring forward. Whoever that is, you'll get to know him, but it just, it's refreshing and I think it's always special and we don't always feel so no one always gives us the permission to do that to be ourselves but you're the one that gives you that permission i i took uh, you know i i took a lot of uh, interest in our conversation so thank you brother and you're a cool dude and all of you are but he he piqued my interest so i kept him in conversation a little bit longer <laughs> joseph you have a question it's a good question. That's a question for the ages. Um, I'm going to say no. It does not make a noise. There is no noise. There is only consciousness. And if, if you're not there to connect with it, it actually just makes air. There's no noise attached to that. So I'm going to say no. Um, but if you were there, your conscious would connect with a sound and that sound would be yours, which is different than the sound that you actually hear, uh, interestingly enough. And I think there's science to back that up. So thank you for asking that biocentric question. I'm, I'm totally into biohacking. And, um, and that's why I feel like there's a chance we, uh, I think 120 is the bar for all of us to live to. Let's start thinking that way. We might not all want to live that long, but capably we can do it. We can, we can do it. And, uh, there's, a, there's a good chance. That's a good question, dude. Let's go cut a tree down. <laughs> you have trees in Canada. Can you, are you allowed to do that or do they frown on that? Yeah, we can't cut ours down. Yeah, yeah. maple. Any other questions in the room? Brian. Brian. What's our training Oh, yes, I just tried to, you know, be as mean and maybe I didn't eat for a month and um, 31 was so because Rob and I are friends and he'd sent the script and I was like, wow, this guy's really awful. If you haven't seen 31, it's it's a really mean spirited movie and it's not nice people and they don't treat each other nice. It's it's akin to if you put a tarantula and a, a, a rattlesnake and, uh, um, you know, a scorpion and a little baby pot pig in a terrarium and you shook them all up so they were just all over each other who'd come out on top it's really ugly that way you know and and so I understood what the task at hand was I didn't understand the reasons but again Rob Zombie said you're the actor um, we came in I wasn't feeling physically my healthiest. I'd come off something else. I think I'd been sick and I, and then I did this stupid thing because, you know, I wanted to be bothersome, physically bothersome. And I'm not a big guy. So you gotta, you know, does, does it bother you at all when you see a dude walking around and he's not wearing a shirt, like on the street? Don't you know that guy's rather sketchy? You know, so I decided I'm not wearing a shirt in this movie and Rob's like, okay. 
And then he goes, how about pants? I go, yeah, I'm wearing pants. He goes, what for? <laughs> so now he goes, how about we just do Daisy Duke? So now I'm wearing Daisy Duke shorts, all right? And I'm very now feeling vulnerable physically. More, it went the other way. Instead of being, you know, like I'm gonna be bothersome, I was like, everyone's looking at my bum. I don't really, you know, I'm, I kind of get what you ladies feel like. And then it became very physical. So, and the chainsaw, the prop one didn't work. So I really got a chainsaw, which oh, is wow. like 60 pounds. And it's, I'm a wimp and it's just, uh, everything was just angry, but it really served the character. Probably the worst thing I've done on film and the hardest thing to get out from underneath my skin, man. Psycho head. Um, so I just decided, well, he's never gonna die. And of course he did, thankfully. <laughs> yes, sir. What's your name? David. I like to know names. Uh, by the way, we all have a good memory. We start off with a good memory. It's just access to using it. It's not that your memory is failing you. It's just you're not using it enough. Your memory is well as good as mine, and or as as Kendra's, who's got a nine-year-old memory, very fresh and clean. We just you just got to use it. It's it's like physical working out. You know, the more you jog, the better you get. You know, the more you lift, the more you can lift. The more you play that song, the better you're gonna get. It's it's just that. So, hi, David. Uh, well, actually, I have a lot of questions asking about that. Good, I like it. Like it. <laughs> you, uh, I, was just, I was really careful looking at your history, and of course, you developed a bunch of uh, interesting anime projects. Yeah. yeah. Uh, bubble gum crisis, like, like a whole bunch of yeah. them. Yeah. I, I always feel like that because anime has become so popular. When I was doing it, it wasn't that popular. I was in Houston, Texas, where I started. And I started, by the way, uh, as you said, uh, Chelsea, uh, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had been in baseball, and so I followed a young lady into an acting class to chat her up for a date. And uh, I saw these people on stage and I said, oh, there's my people, there's my tribe. And I can do that. Well, I couldn't do that, but I did figure out, I was smart enough to know to go back to Brooklyn College to understand how to do that, which I did. In Texas, there was a company called ADV, this little company that had purchased all of the titles out of Japan to do the translation for anime. So they were, looking for voice they just needed actors to come in and match back then it was matching lip flaps so you, there was a japanese translation into english none of it fit you know the monster's on its way it's transitioning into there you know it was ridiculous and they just needed people to be able to take direction and and so there was a group of actors in Houston, Texas, and we did all those things. Several of them are still doing them today, and now it's a big business. It wasn't so much then. So now they have like really tight professional voice actors that are getting the opportunity to do Dragon Ball Z and you know Pikachu and all these other things. I'd love to do them. I, voice acting is, is a gas. It's a lot of fun. It's still acting though, I recognize you still have to bring it, you have to bring character. But that's why I got to do all those historic things. I was just Johnny on the spot in a weird place and environment. And some of those are really like great titles that are antique, like Hello. Super Mario. <laughs> We're in the last few minutes here, guys. Any last questions for Lou? Was he an actor your first choice? No. 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 Leanne, Leanne, right? right? Leanne, Leanne. L-I-A-N-E. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cool. Leon acting was never my choice. When I was growing up, when I was your age, probably your age, I didn't really know what an actor was. So I thought Steve Austin was Steve Austin. I didn't know who Lee Majors was. You know, I didn't know Tom Selleck, but I knew Magnum. I didn't know, I thought they were real and we were just watching their lives on camera. I didn't grow up with a, we didn't have tabloids around the house i'm sure they were out there but we didn't really recognize what hollywood was or so i didn't have a sense of what being an actor was but i, I do come from a land of storytelling and very jovial people and sometimes you've got to perform for your supper you've got to 
sing well, play jazz music in New Orleans, to get noticed, you better be, if you're not the most handsome guy in the room, you better have something, right? So that was, there was always something about me that was able to perform, but I love baseball and I recognized it was mine. Now, my rest of my family and heritage were musicians and I recognized baseball was mine. So I'm going to make, I'm going to own that. So I love baseball and I still dream about playing in the major leagues. The same dream I had when I was 12 years old. It's the same one. I get it, you know, every three weeks I have the same dream, which I think is cool. Um, Cause in my life it means I, I, I actually never age. I'm going to live to 120. Um, so it wasn't. So my point about that is you can find it, but be available because what really happens is it find it's looking for you. And so you have to have to be available. You have to take off your blinders, whatever those are. And, you know, for me, it's, oh my God, I got to get somewhere to do this. I've got to pay that. I, I need to make more money to pay for that. I got it. I got it. I got it. And really you don't got to do any of that. And if you take that got a hat off and just see the gifts around you, you could grab one and it's been sitting there for you the, your entire life and it's great. And I think that's what happened for me. I think I've been able to, I'm not luckier than anybody, but I'm aware that luck is out there waiting for me, really cool. And getting more aware. I work harder at getting aware. So for me, what, I didn't know I was going to meet any of you today, but I did know it was going to be great and it was going to be cool and I was going to have great questions and great answers. I did know that and I knew that I couldn't write it. I can't write my life as good as it's been. I could write it perfect. I could make all the money in the world. I could be the greatest at this and I could be in the major leagues and it still wouldn't be better than what life has in store for me. So I know that and I give in to that, what I call the wisdom of the unknown. So every day I get up, I go, I don't know, but I know it's gonna be great. And it works for me. Try it someday. I believe you had a question. Oh, oh. Sue. Yeah. Um, how did you enjoy working on television? For Rob, it was great. Uh, again, difficult scene, obviously, with Michael Myers, we had some, you know, close set, there was, a, there, there was some sensitive issues and, and we needed to do uh, difficult work. So there was an intensity. At that time, that was the worst thing that I'd ever done, that guy, but he had a lot more reason than this other guy. Um, so I found it to be a challenge for sure, but at some point I felt like it had more reason. You know, I was more of a guy whose dad didn't play catch with him and who was wanting to have Michael Myers under my thumb, get him engaged in being, you know, he's like your bad friend. It's always getting you in trouble. Hey, come do this. If we do this thing, then you're just as bad as me type thing. So I, I appreciated the reason of that character, maybe not the result of that character. Again, we were we were duplicating John Carpenter's original, so there was some pressure on us. It wasn't really. I think it all worked out well, but there were some people that weren't happy. We were, you know, always as you do reboots, they're not pleased. But I, I was happy with it, and it, it was intense. It was work, yeah. Uh, I was I felt very fortunate to be able to work with the people I did because uh, Courtney Gaines and the young lady. Uh, Rebecca Murtaugh, that was the young lady that we did terrible things to, and Tyler Maine, who's a Canardian. Um, remember that word? <laughs> Way back. Yeah, man. It was, it was intense. I believe we have time for one more question. The old one more, Brian. Are you it? I asked this Wait. Question. This has got to be the question, right? <laughs> I mean, this has got to be a why are we here type thing. I mean, you, you got to bring it, dude, because you're it's not your question. It's everyone's question in this room. Do you, do you I, feel so, it? Yeah. So okay. I asked the same thing that Scott, was there any roles that you turned down that you regret in hindsight? Is there a role that I turned down that I regret in hindsight? Yes. Last year, there was a gentleman here who came last year. There was a 
interesting guy with an interesting voice and he's a science teacher. Ah. I regret turning down that role on Stranger Things. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy he did it. Almost everything that I've seen someone do that I don't get, I'm like, he did better than I could. I, my, you know, there's very few things I'm like, oh, I could have done better than that. Most times I see it and I go, oh, wow. He's so much, he's so much better. Um, I was doing a movie called Kidnap when Stranger Things called. It was all a money thing. I said, nah, yeah, no thanks. They don't call me anymore. I remember I was doing a movie called Domino in Las Vegas and I got a call from a company called Wire Image and they said, we'd like to do an album cover with you on it. It's kind of weird, uh, this band. And I'm like, I don't really want to do that. And it was The Killers. It was their very first album. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I always call Brandon Flowers as much as I can find him to ask if he'll hang with me. He never returns my calls. <laughs> so yeah, there's things, but I, I think that's good, good for you in life. But what's the lesson there? Don't say yes. Say yes to life. Hey, can you give me a ride? Yes. Can I borrow 10 bucks? Yes. Can you hang out here for a year in Hawaii and, and watch my house? Yes. Just say yes. That's, that's my thing. So yes, not no, I need this or I need more money. I can't do that. You can do anything. You, you should do it. Everything can do anything. Should do everything. All of us, right? Thank you. This has been great. You guys, y'all are lovely audience, not just that, but cool people. And I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Let's get up Lou. Did you see where my cowboy hat went? Did anyone see where my cowboy hat went? Scout still has it. Damn. <laughs>